good evening, everyone. It's lovely to uh, be with you here tonight. Um, welcome. This is the second webinar from the Open Table Network, um, uh, and it's a Q&A with our new patrons. Uh, my name's Kieran Bohan, and I have the privilege of being the coordinator of the Open Table Network. And if you're fairly new to the Open Table Network, we're a growing partnership of uh, inclusive churches across England and Wales, which host LGBT affirming worship communities. John Bradbury uh, is with us this evening. Uh, John Bradbury was a founder of one of those congregations, so we may hear more about that in due course. But uh, John, welcome. Thank you very much for finding the time to be with us tonight. You um, are now the General Secretary of the United Reformed Church in recent months. So um, I expect we'll hear a little more, more about how that's been uh, shortly. Um, and it's uh, really good to be with you. And I'm very pleased that you felt able to join us as a patron. Thank you. It's good to be with you. So, John, um, I'm going to ask a series of questions, some of which were put together by myself and, uh, and the trustees, but some are from members of the assembled community and some folk who couldn't be here tonight but wanted um, to put a question to you in any case. So, John, I'd like to begin just to well, let people know, really, I don't think many people will know that actually you and I met in 2005, and that was in the early days of your ordained ministry, um, because you were ordained in the city the previous year. That's right, yeah. And much of your work was part of the ecumenical team in the city centre, wasn't it? Yep. And so I met you in part because you worked closely with the Somewhere Else community, which was a Methodist-run fresh expression of church, and it also hosted an LGBT plus affirming Christian group of which I was a member at the time. So thinking back about 15 years, if you care to, um, what did you value about your time in Liverpool and how does that still inform your ministry today? Well, I was partly minister of a, a small little inner city um, church in an area of high urban deprivation with all the kind of issues that come with that. And then partly working in the city center with this weird and wonderful ecumenical team and landed um, in a possibly weirder and more wonderful yet um, somewhere else community uh, where I worked very closely with uh, my Methodist colleague, Barbara Glasson, who's now uh, also one of the, the patrons of Open Table. Um, and somewhere else was just a, an extraordinary kind of community that gathered around uh, the baking of, of bread and people baked and talked and uh, prayed and um, shared the stories of life together. Um, and it, it was an extraordinary place to begin working out what it meant to be a minister, because, you know, you're ordained and, and actually working out what, what, that, what that really means and how you kind of inhabit that is quite something. Uh, and it was fascinating to do it in this very traditional, very small, struggling little congregation and this context of the city centre where, you know, the whole city centre was kind, kind of our patch. Um, and, and I found it absolutely intriguing that um, the places where I had all the conversations about God, the places where people wanted to ask about, um, you know, the faith, they wanted to ask the big questions of the meaning of life, the universe and everything, were not in the church. They were not the kind of long established church members, many of whom were wonderful folk, but they were the folk kind of wandering around the streets of Liverpool who would um, find their way somehow or other up the staircase and, and bake some bread with us. Um, and I think it, it gave me um, a passion for forms of ministry that are kind of on the edge of church life, which might sound a bit odd for someone who's just now kind of taken on a role, absolutely kind of slap bang in the heart of the institution, as it were. But um, there is something utterly feeding and enriching to the life of the church by those who are wanting to um, encounter the stories of the faith, uh, who are wanting to engage, who are wanting to explore their spirituality um, and you know I think some of the most creative things in church life happen on those kinds of edges um, and I think Liverpool really helped me um, explore what that could mean um, and I think when you're new in ministry you also need people who are going to be your your friends your mentors they're, they're going to take you under their wing a bit uh, and for me Barbara was one of those people she was a, an extraordinary person to to get the chance to work alongside and I learned an enormous amount 
from her. So I think there's an, an awful lot from my time in in um, Liverpool I, I take with me and, you know, probably some of the more, more boring bits. I remember unpicking kind of the constitution of the city centre ecumenical team and dealing with documents and local ecumenical um, models of partnership and this, that and the other. So some of all of that stuff, which now sits on my desk in a different way, I suspect I began to do in Liverpool too. Barbara had a particular role in mentoring others, didn't she? And, and she is one, one of my mentors too. So I, so not a lot of people might know that some of, some of the patrons have in fact been significant in either my personal journey or the journey of Open Table. Um, and so that's one of the ways in which we reconnected in recent years was that in 2018, you helped set up the Open Table Cambridge community. And this year you became a patron of the Open Table Network. So why does Open Table matter to you personally, John? I still haven't quite gotten over the fact that someone's asked me to be a patron of something. It makes me feel ancient. I can't possibly be old enough to be a patron of something, surely. It kind of, <laughs> still makes me, makes me want to laugh. Um, now, Open Table Cambridge was an amazing journey. Uh, and um, it was the brainchild, really, of um, Alison Binney. Uh, and Alison had had something of a vision of what might be possible for uh, an LGBT plus um, worshipping community and had um, made contact, I think, with, with you just before I was called to become the minister in, in Cambridge. Um, and then it was something we, we very much worked on together. And, um, and it was, it, you know, it was quite an extraordinary experience. Um, I think in church life, we often, you know, we're used to dealing with decline. We're used to dealing with things that don't work very well. We're used to dealing quite a lot of the time with things that fail. Um, and actually, I remember the very first evening that we gathered and Alison had done an amazing job advertising it and the social media thing and posters up and, um, uh, and we had no idea who would come. And I think there were 10 or 12 folk there. We were completely blown away that sort of seemingly out of nowhere this had happened. Um, and it became a, a, a wonderful journey as people came came in and some people became very core kind of members and started mm -hmm. to become the heart of the community and other folk drift in and out and lots of people would just come along to find out what was going on and see whether it was them uh, for them or not and some would come back and some wouldn't and folk would come from other places saying oh we've heard what you're doing we were thinking about doing something similar and um, we thought we'd come and find out what you were up to um, or folk even from churches perhaps not at all known for their uh, inclusion of LGBT people would, would come and say, well, you know, will you help talk with us and pray with us about how we might help our churches become more inclusive? So um, it was a really, um, really extraordinary um, journey. Uh, and, um, you know, and I, and I think, you know, partly back to my days in Liverpool and the days of uh, storm uh, as it, as it was when we, um, we gathered there to worship there's a kind of you know there is something special uh, about a safer lgbt plus space for worship um you know you can find all sorts of other safe spaces but one where that sense that you can just absolutely be yourself without question uh, and come to worship and in a sense it maybe brings down some of the barriers that sometimes can be there for some of us as we come uh, to worship uh, and to know that actually we're in a, a community that entirely upholds us in our relationship with with Christ that um, that doesn't question why we're on the journey or, or path of discipleship and that there is something something liberating about that uh, particularly perhaps when that hasn't been people's people's experience so all of that I've come to value hugely about um, open table and the fact that at the heart of open table lies the act of worship the table, um, Holy Communion, that we we celebrate the Eucharist together. Um, there's something very special about the fact that at the heart of this lies worship. Mm -hmm. um, not, you know, there might be all sorts of other spin-offs. It might be great for our social life. It might have a political dimension, but actually at the heart of this is our relationship with God and we come to worship. And that's, right. that's hugely special. I think that's one of the reasons why it's taken on a life of its own, really. Um, and the, the Cambridge community is a particularly fine example of, of you know, communities. It's seen substantial growth in, in just over two years, in spite of the challenges of this past few months. 
um, and one of the few communities that began to meet twice a month. There's only three out of the 17 communities in the network that have begun to meet more than once a month. So it's tremendous that you've seen that you saw such growth in such a relatively short space of time. And uh, all credit to Alison and Olga and others who have um, hold that space so beautifully. So perhaps more broadly, um, given that a number of open table groups are hosted or have been hosted by United Reformed Churches, what do you value most about the URC's understanding of the place of human sexuality and gender in faith? In a sense, it would be difficult to say what the URC's um, position on all of this is. And in actual fact, I think that's one of the things I've really come to value. Um, one of the things that kind of scares me almost at the minute about, about life in the world in general and the, the way church life can mirror it is this tendency we have to, to fall into kind of culture wars um, and the quite, you know, violent and vitriolic kind of taking up of, of black and white positions that, um, that we see going on all over the place in, in the media. We've seen it quite a lot in the media coming out of church life in the last few weeks. Um, and I think um, the URC, for all its faults and failings, has done something quite remarkable, actually, in creating a space where we've managed to say, actually, human sexuality is, in the context of the life of faith, a secondary issue. It's not a primary issue. Um, and th th there was some very interesting um, conversations about, you know, the URC's doctrine of marriage. And actually, as we delved into this at the time, we don't have a doctrine of marriage set out in black and white. Um, it's, it's not part of our foundational documents. It's not part of the way in which we confess the life of the faith. It's part of the practicing life of the church, as marriage has always been a, a practice, first and foremost, rather than anything else. And, and I think you know, the fact that we have managed to, very uncomfortably for many of us, because for many of us, you know, we want this to go much further than it, it's gone. For others, they're deeply uncomfortable that this is, you know, things have gone as far as they have, as it were. But we have managed to find a place where we can be completely honest about who we are and what we are, uh, where different local churches can, um, can take different positions on this, which is very uncomfortable. Um, but it has allowed for a level of honesty about um, questions surrounding sexuality and gender, which um, I think some church traditions, particularly where the, the sort of don't ask, don't tell mm -hmm. doctrine um, hangs around the air, it, it's very difficult. So, you know, I value hugely that I can be open about my sexuality within the life of the United Reformed Church, that churches I have been part of and are part of um, our inclusive communities will celebrate same-sex marriages. But I also treasure the fact um, that we are a diverse <laughs> church that has managed to avoid tipping that over into a culture war and that my sisters and brothers are also, you know, and, and we're a small church, we know one another, they're also good friends who are conservative evangelicals who might take a very different kind of position. And there's something quite special in our ability to hold that very uncomfortably together. But I think, um, I think it models something um, something quite countercultural to the winner takes all cultural war model of, of engaging around some of these issues that we tend to live with. How do you feel the URC has managed to do that um, to hold those tensions between the different um, different positions on gender and sexuality? There's been some very influential um, voices along the way uh, that have come maybe from some very unexpected places. Um, so when we um, when we made our commitment, as, as it came to be called, commitment on human sexuality, which upholds the diversity of views within the life of the church and says that they can all be held with integrity, uh, the primary move for that came from someone who had been a very <coughs> conservative voice in debates previously. Um, and it was their conviction about grace which did this. Uh, and... And I remember in a very early meeting about this, the person concerned said, you know, I suddenly realised that, you know, I stand in need of God's grace and so does everybody else. And actually, who was I to say that other people were more in need of God's grace or, or, or less deserving of it than I was? 
And I also have to say, I don't think I'm wrong, but I might be wrong. Mm. Uh, and actually, you know, who am I to say that, that you are not my sisters and brothers if God has called you to be my sisters and brothers? And that was a quite remarkable, remarkable thing for someone who had come from a very conservative part of the, of the church. Mm -hmm. But I think there is a, a kind of, um, you know, we, we can't ever do these things in our own power, can we? There is something about, about God's grace that enables us precisely to, to live with one another in sometimes the most uncomfortable of, of ways. Um, and I think that then also create, has created a space where people feel that they can genuinely share their stories and speak of their experiences. Um, and I think a lot of people are touched by stories and experiences who are not going to be touched by theological debates about doctrine. Um, and, you know, and it's allowed a space where People can tell the, the stories of their children and their grandchildren and their relationships. Uh, and I think, you know, creating a safe space has then in, in turn since that moment when we made that commitment allowed for things to develop in, in new ways, allow us to um, register buildings for same-sex marriages and, and so on. You know, it, it's a journey. With, we're still on it. It's still very uncomfortable. But, but at the end of the day, I think it, it, you know, it can only be the grace of the Holy Spirit working in our midst, which has enabled us to to get to get where we are. Absolutely. And so there's um, there's three of our participants who have suggested questions that draw parallels with um, the challenges that women ministers have faced in the past. Um, so in, and in a number of traditions, there have been times when women ministers were tolerated and are now widely accepted in more traditions. And and they felt that currently the URC has a tolerance for LGBT plus folk and some churches are more accepting than others. So how do you feel an, an LGBT plus newcomer to a URC church could know if it's a church which would affirm them and provide a safe space? I suspect it's, it's partly, you know, how an individual would approach any <laughs> church community. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? We learn to read the signs, don't we? Mm -hmm. Is this or is this not a place? I'm going to be welcome and there are the telltale signs and the language and the yeah. linguistic cues yeah. and the symbols that you look for and so on and so forth but I, I mean I was in a meeting the other day which which I thought brought home to me quite nicely where sometimes we we get these things wrong we were we had this presentation by the people who are redesigning the URC's website my, my goodness does it it need a redesign um, and it was pointed out to us that anyone from outside the church who wanted to find out about um, a same-sex marriage might type that in and end up on our, our web page um, looking for where they might be able to have a same-sex marriage. And we've mm -hmm. got you know, 100 plus churches where that might well be possible. Are we signposting people to them? Well, no, actually we're not. We're giving people a whole load of technical information about how they, how they would register their building to celebrate these things and the forms they need to fill in and where they post them off to and, and how to consult the registrar's office. And it's kind of all this very internal churchy yeah. stuff about, about technicalities, which of course we, we need. Um, you know, and I, I suspect there are quite simple things actually we can still do that often we just don't stop to think about that, that will that help people work out where are the places that will be, be safe and where are the places that they can uh, be fully fully included but it, very much a work in progress that's the, very much something that we talk to potential open table host churches about about how do you make visible your commitment or your intention and and you know and lots of churches say they're welcoming but they don't necessarily think about how they can be inviting people in yeah. you know so if if we're if our church websites are filled with our internal processes for example that's not the, the most inviting thing you can be doing so that's a really interesting example um but on the flip side of that do you think that those churches in the urc and other traditions which are non-affirming need to be more open about that i've had various various stories in the, in the last few years all of a similar sort of pattern of people who've been quite involved in their churches not necessarily mm -hmm. urc churches um, but, you know, who want to begin to take up some kind of leader position, leadership position, maybe they want to, you know, lead a Bible study group or a house group, and they talk to the leadership of the church, and then they kind of just drop in, oh, you know, the fact that I'm gay isn't going to be a problem, is it? And, oh, all of a sudden, yeah. oh, well, actually, you know, that, mm, not sure about that leadership position, mm, we might have to have a conversation about that. Mm -hmm. And and I have, have heard, 
a, a few stories of people who've then been quite taken aback and said, but I've never heard you preach about this. I've never heard you teach about Indeed. this. Um, you know, so how come you're now saying this to me now? Mm. Um, uh, and in one instance, um, someone reported to me that, that in response to that question, they got the answer, oh, well, if we preached and taught about what we really believe about this, we'd lose half our congregation. Mm, oh, my goodness. And, you know, there's yeah. a kind of question of integrity, isn't there? there mm. <laughs> when, you, when you have reached that point. Um, and I do think that um, for a community to have integrity, it does need to be willing to, to be fairly clear about mm. who or what it is. And I don't think it needs to do that in a nasty way. No. <laughs> I don't think it needs to do that in a personalised way. Um, and if communities are really not willing to do that, I wonder whether that's a sign maybe that they need to stop and think a little bit harder about why they're so uncomfortable about being a little bit more publicly explicit about the fact that they're not inclusive and they, you know, that there, there are barriers to full involvement in the life of this church. Um, so... You know, I think I think it's incumbent upon any community to have have integrity, uh, 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 and as it were, to say what you mean and mean what you say. Um, mm. uh, and you know, we all need to do that wherever we're coming mm. from. We hear a number of stories um, uh, just like that from from a number of traditions, that, and that's where a, a lot of the greatest hurt and harm takes place. Is that somebody might have been involved for for months or years and and it was only when they they bring a partner or, or they suddenly feel able to be more open in some other way yeah. um, that suddenly they then feel they're no longer welcome and that's where great great damage can be done so absolutely we would support that visibility of intention yeah. um, for whatever church's position to be more visible about that so that's a really helpful um, examples there um so how do you feel the urc could actively involve more lgbt plus people and champion the issues that affect lgbt plus christians in particular it's an interesting question i mean in all all kinds of ways i think lgbt people are, are perhaps better represented in some of the significant places in the structure of, of the united reformed church than some other groups might be you know we're we're, we're much we're much better, for example, on LGBT representation than perhaps we are in our very senior posts with VAME representation, which we need to stop and think very mm. hard about. Um, and and I, I think the question the question that concerns me is perhaps less immediately about the, the structures of the church, where I think um, um, things could always be better, but I, I think we do quite well. I think it is much more that question of the local church how can local churches um you know those who who you know would be quite committed to this and they would think of themselves as inclusive communities and they you know but how can they actively make that shift from um not being exclusionary to being genuinely welcoming mm -hmm. um and that's something um that you know in various ways at various moments in the life of the urc we've tried to to help local churches engage with those those kinds of questions but you know there is something very different isn't there from you know as it were not not excluding someone to actually reaching out when um when you're reaching out to a community of folk who often have been very hurt by the church who receive very negative messages from the church um and actually just being there as people pass by isn't really enough uh, and as you're willing to actively reach out um and 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 head out to the kind of places um, where perhaps we're not expected to be found, um, we're going to struggle. So, in my um, kind of best memories of my my ministry in Cambridge was was when um, Alison cooked up the cunning plan that we would go to Pride and we took our we took our stuff to Pride and I put my dog collar on, which I don't particularly often do, and and we had our stall and people could write their prayers on pink hearts and put them on put them on the, the screen and so on. And I was absolutely fascinated that um, a significant number of my ecumenical clergy colleagues from the city um, turned up at Pride and, uh, and came over and said hello. And not one of them was there in their 
no, that's not quite true. Actually, they were some people there in their official capacity and their dog collars and being there. But a goodly number of them were were there in mufti, shall we say, and certainly not not actively representing their church communities. And and actually, the the contacts that we made that day, mm. and the number of people who were just kind of you know some people really quite overwhelmed just yes. that we were there, you know, quite astonished me because I wondered what kind of response we would get mm. because you know, the LGBT plus community has got lots of reasons to be really quite suspicious of the, of the life of the church. So, so a lot of it is about how we actively reach out mm. um, as much as those of us who've made it in actually then feeling like we, we might belong in the, in the wider structures of the, of the church. Absolutely. And it's, it's, a, it's my experience of, of being with communities at Pride is that it's a tremendous witness. You know, it's showing that there's there's more than one Christian voice on, on these issues. And it's not just the voice of the protesters with the Old Testament quotes on placards, is it? So, um, right. yeah, that's uh, it's a it's a very rich place for a, um, a Christian community to be present as a, a witness of you know, God's love. Um, so we've had a, a question um around how the URC is continuing conversations on LGBT plus inclusion. Um, and that's coming from the context of the 2016 vote, which allowed congregations to conduct same-sex marriages while re retaining the church's traditional view on marriage as an official position. So I'm, uh, I'm reliably informed that, that at the time of that vote, it was spoken of as the beginning of thinking again about marriage, which implies that if that was the beginning, then that's an ongoing process. And I mean, so I, how is how are those conversations yeah. continuing? You know, as I as I said before, we didn't actually have a, a stated doctrine of marriage per se. So we, mm. we didn't affirm a, a traditional teaching of marriage. What we affirmed was that marriage was a practice and that it evolves over time, and it has, um, and it has evolved as long as I can remember. You know, back to my teenage years, the years in which my vocation to ministry was kind of emerging you know the, the church was at loggerheads over sexuality it was mm. impossible it was difficult people were arguing um and you know that continued and continued and continued and uh and in the end we put a moratorium on decision making because we couldn't work out how to talk anymore about it for seven years and at the end of it emerged this commitment that i was talking about um uh and and then it was sort of after that as the the years after that when it suddenly became possible to contract first civil partnerships and then marriages and buildings we had to deal with that and that was all difficult and that was all hard work and I think actually we kind of got to the other end of that and everybody um, has found that you know we can cope with the place we're living in we've take we've kind of breathed a huge sigh of relief and kind of stopped thinking about it and it's interesting, maybe we need to begin to think about it a bit more in some new and different ways. Um, I, think, I think a lot of us have enjoyed the peace of not, not being perpetually kind of engaged in strife over this, and that's a really good thing. There are, there are still um, um, kind of initiatives that we, we take from time to time. We've just been working on some information for local churches on how best they might minister with trans folk um, uh, just in terms of the way they might extend pastoral care and mm. the issues that they might might need to be aware of if they're ministering with trans folk uh, that's something that we're making available to to local churches through our the work of our equalities committee so, th so there are, are some things that we have been doing but but it has it's gone a bit quiet mm -hmm. um, and, and actually, that has been really rather nice for it to go a bit quiet. Um, but, you know, actually, <laughs> um, there is still much, much to talk about. There is, um, you know, still much to think about. Uh, and we maybe need to be a bit more intentional about that again. I think it's common to other traditions, too, that uh, um, I think the, the questioner um, was particularly concerned about URC churches feeling like they're safe places. And also equal places, which is more safety and equality is more than just about whether or not one can marry. Um, I think that's the, the where that's coming from. But yes, I think in the church's dialogue around it has very much focused on relationships rather than wider senses of belonging and safety. Um, 
But uh, that phrase, thinking again about marriage, it was used in reference to that conversation, leads us rather nicely into your book. Mm -hmm. um, so you co-edited this book, Thinking Again About Marriage, with Susanna Cornwall, um, and it was published in 2016. And uh, so in the introduction, uh, you wrote that one of the catalysts for compiling the book was frustration about the kind of conversations about marriage that were taking place or not taking place in the churches. Um, so what were those frustrations about four years ago and what do you feel has changed since then, if anything? It probably goes back rather longer than that. It was the day that the Church of England published one of its submissions to one of the government consultations on changes to marriage law. I can't quite remember which mm. one. Um, and, um, and, oh, it was, it, was, it was dreadful. I mean, it really was. And, uh, and a good friend of mine, no, their, their Facebook thread, and it was just sort of heaving with, with very upset and angry theologians at the kind of ineptitude of this statement that had been put out. Mm. Um, and this response to the government consultation, I mean, it was pretty extraordinary. It was historically inaccurate. You know, it, it simply said things that were not true about the history of the development of the legal status of marriage. It was theologically completely inept. Uh, you know, it held up what's you know this whole um, business of complementarianism. You know, a man and a woman complete one another, and that's the definition of a marriage as being this ancient tradition of church life. When actually, you know, it's really not. This is a very modern, um, a modern way of of reading scripture, and it emerges into popular theology actually in some of the writings of Pope John Paul II. I mean, we're, we're literally talking that sort of modern with, with some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there were all sorts of things about it that, that just, <laughs> just irritated us beyond belief. And it reached that point in the Facebook thread where someone said, we ought to write a book about this. And actually kind of miraculously, we, we did end up writing a book about it. Um, and we got together on a few occasions to discuss it. And, you know, different people wrote different chapters and Susanna and I wrote the introduction and, and you know, all the stuff you do when you write a book, and, um, and there it is. But I, I think what we were, we were really keen to say is actually this needs to be um, a, a theological conversation uh, and genuinely a conversation about what marriage is. Um, and I say a theological conversation because I, I think quite often in church life we like to think that we can go directly from the pages of scripture to our modern context and 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 somehow or other from that we will we will read every, you know we will get the answers to our questions and of course actually um theology you know the discipline and art of theology of talking about god thinking logically about it um thinking with the tradition of the church thinking you know with classic church doctrine the teachings of the church the, you know, you, you put all of this together in, in quite um, kind of rich and varied and complex ways. And, and you begin to see that actually maybe the tradition of the church says some very different sorts of things uh, to the ones that you get if all you're going to do is go straight from, you know, Bible to everyday, everyday life. And of course, it's, it's very rarely a, a, a full and deep engagement with scripture either. So we said there is genuinely a theological conversation to have here uh, that we don't see any much theology going going on um and questions about you know everyone is saying is you know who can get married well surely the question who can get married uh depends to a very significant degree on what you actually think a marriage is and what does the christian tradition have to say about what a marriage is um and the place that marriage takes in in the christian life i mean in 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 so many ways, you'd often think when you hear the way some folk go on that, you know, Jesus decreed that you can only be a proper Christian if you are married with 2.4 children. Um, Jesus never got married. He was celibate. St. Paul thought marriage was second best for those who couldn't keep their legs crossed. You know, it, it, there's a kind of um, complete misreading that goes on in much of the, the tradition. And, you know, you hit the you hit the middle ages and and still the celibate life the celibate religious life is the pinnacle of religious life it's not marriage marriage is is still that sort of second best um that changes rather at the reformation when when marriage takes on a much more kind of central place as um 
and you know as you dissolve the monasteries and you move religious life into the domestic home and there's all sorts of, of good things about that but it also does some slightly strange things to to what we think marriage is so you know it, we read this submission from the church of england uh, and we're just frankly pretty appalled that the established church of the realm uh, could say things that were factually inaccurate could say things that were theologically completely illiterate um and and that was a complete, you know, it felt like an attempt to defend an increasingly indefensible position mm -hmm. by the, you know, well, if in doubt, just shout louder kind of method of arg arguing. And, um, you know, and we w we wanted to have a different kind of conversation uh, about some some different kinds of things that we think actually are are really relevant and germane to all these questions that surround human sexuality. So, so we wrote a book. A significant part of your career um, has been engaged in ecumenism, so working across church traditions. And the URC does have a strong commitment to um, ecumenism. So what, to what extent do you feel that um, that commitment to ecumenism can help in conversations with other denominations about recognising um, civil partnerships and same-sex marriages? I think our instinctive ecumenical instincts um, have allowed us to hear voices that sometimes don't get heard and I think that has been hugely helpful in this process. Our ecumenical instincts can also lead us to be terribly polite ecumenically and and not point out things to others that perhaps maybe at times we we ought to um, a little bit more carefully. Um, this does at times make relationships um, strained where otherwise they would be easier um, and not always in in sort of obvious ways but you know we have um, you know a, a good you know, two three hundred joint URC Methodist churches and the Methodist mm -hmm. church is obviously on a journey and it, 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 it's having discussions that very much mirror the ones that, that, that we had and may well end up in a similar place but at the mm -hmm. minute um, you know we can't register those church buildings uh, if they're a joint church for same-sex marriage uh, and that can frustrate those congregations and that doesn't necessarily split URC Methodist in the congregations but they get frustrated that you know it's actually being ecumenical which is stopping them from moving forward in ways that they would would want to to move forward um, you know the whole business of the CTE presidency and the the empty chair you know, so for those that may not know, so CT is the churches together in England, is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and they, uh, the Qua it was the Quakers' turn to nominate, and they nominated a woman who was more than qualified, who happened to be married to another woman, is, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so it's extraordinary that, you know, so Quakers don't um, generally believe in baptism, for example, um, and so that wasn't considered to be a barrier to their membership of churches together in England. But um, churches together in England refused to recognise the appointment of this Quaker woman because she was married to another woman. So they seem to have made marriage the kind of defining characteristic of, of what it is to be Christian. I find it quite extraordinary. I also find it extraordinary when ecumenism is precisely about um, holding together our, our differences and learning to explore them together that there are some differences we say, well, we just will not engage, full stop. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, yeah, I find that, that a huge uh, struggle. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't accept, I don't expect everybody to uh, think like I do, um, but not even to be willing to sit around the table, I find pretty extraordinary. So how can we sit together at an open table with people with, who would disagree with or exclude us? You know, it's by grace that we can sit at a table with those people who who would would exclude us. Clearly, we can't. You know, we can't force people to come to the party, as it were. Um, if other people just will not sit at a table with us, there's there's not a lot we can do about that. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I I I hope that my tendency would always be to be willing to sit at the table with someone with whom I profoundly disagreed, mm -hmm. because however else. Am I going to expect to have any kind of influence on on them if I'm not even willing to get into the the conversation? Um, but boy, it's hard some, some days. Some days it's 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 tough. It's very difficult. I mean, you know, it's only it's only by 
by the grace of God that we 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 can stay at that table, and it, and it's costly. I think perhaps we can move from thinking about the challenge of an open table to the thing that unites us around the open table, which you know, the defining characteristic of an open table community is gathering in that central act of hospitality of our faith in communion. Um, and that's why we took that name. And you recently published a paper, didn't you, called COVID-19, The Church and Holy Communion, in which you reflected on the theology and practice of communion during this crisis. Um, so from your experience of being with the Open Table community in Cambridge and your wider ministry, do you think communion has a particular importance for LGBT plus Christians? I think probably so. I mean, our, our different traditions place the Eucharist in, in different places, as it were, uh, in, you know, most churches in my own tradition, it wouldn't be the central act of worship every Sunday. It would be it would be something we celebrate normally maybe once a month. Uh, I rather wish it were the central act of worship every Sunday, but you know I'm, I'm a little bit of an outlier in the URC on, on that one. Mm. But I think it is particularly um, something which touches the lives of those of us who are LGBT plus because it has been the site of so much exclusion historically. Um, even when perhaps we personally haven't experienced it, the church has very often used whether or not it will let you into the Eucharist as a, a means of control and discipline. Um, and, you know, one sees that historically in the traditions I come from, you know, uh, did you or did you not get your communion card to be let into the act of communion? Had you been, you know, had you been good enough? Um, we, we still see it in some traditions where one might, be refused uh, the Eucharist if you're in a same-sex relationship or if you're divorced and remarried or so on. And, and I think be, because it's got those resonances of, of, the, of control and power and, um, and the kind of use and abuse of authority, um, I think for those of us in any way who who come in those categories of people who would at one point or in in some places now be excluded for who we are um it is a very powerful reality that we are invited to christ's table christ's invitation is our invitation to the table um and you know that this is something that um you know uh, the table does not at the end of the day belong to the church the table does belong to christ christ stands and invites us and that is immensely powerful when um part of your lived reality as i think you know as someone who who grew up gay certainly part of my lived reality was was that sense of exclusion from all kinds of spaces um or you know the inability to feel that i could fully be who I was or own who I was or so on um, and I think the Eucharist as you put it as that central act of Christian hospitality um, takes on all those very powerful resonances for anyone um, who has experienced exclusion of any of any form. Thank you very much that's very much at the heart of the open table story um, and across traditions so do we have any questions from the floor at the moment? Um, so there's a, a point to about the, the Churches Together in England um, issue that we, we talked about here before. So when they refused to let the Quaker nominee take up their chair role, um, Cathy's asks, should more direct action be taken about that? So given that it's called Churches Together in England, then they're there to represent all of us. So um, what would you suggest? Should we be taking more direct action in response to such an incident? at what point do you leave the table for the sake of protecting an open table? Uh, and it's always a double bind, isn't it? Um, I, I, I think it's, it's one of those, those moments when I think a lot of churches were really kind of caught on the hop. They didn't know how to respond. They were very taken aback that the situation had, had even arisen um, and people had to respond pretty swiftly um and you know i hasten to add fortunately this was before my time sitting in this particular mm. office i didn't have to be part of the discussions about how we responded to that and i'm very grateful i didn't have to be part of those discussions um i i think it is an interesting question as to um 
as you know whether in solidarity other people shouldn't have taken up their presidential roles uh i can quite see why for the um leadership of many churches that would be um a really scary prospect because of what it would do to the internal unity within the life of of their churches and yet actually it's um it's only when people will make some kind of a stand at times that things move forward so i'm not sure that's much of a, a direct um answer but uh, but there we go so th how has it been for you in these recent months as an out gay person stepping into such a public and senior leadership role oh remarkably kind of uneventful really in in <laughs> in those terms um um I mean, I suppose my, my my coming out in church life has been going, well, I mean, you never stop coming out, do you? You're always coming out. Um, and I suppose this process of starting coming out happened, you know, when I was in my late teens, early 20s, uh, when I was a very young ordinand, and I suppose in different ways ever since, in all the debates we had that led up to the formation of the um, commitment on human sexuality, I was part of the group that brought that into being. I was one of the people who was willing to draw on their own stories of their own uh, sexuality in, in a, a big sort of consultation and listening exercise that we had. If you ferret around on the URC website for long enough, you'll still find a, a paper there I wrote in which I'm, I'm quite clear about my own um, sexuality. And, and so um, it was not particularly big or shocking news to anybody, I think. And in fact, I am not aware of having heard or myself received any comment whatsoever uh, about my sexuality since I came into this role. Uh, maybe, maybe I've missed something. Uh, maybe I don't listen in the right places. Um, but I haven't heard anything. So remarkably uneventful, which is kind of as you might hope it would be, really. What's been your impression of the recent um, developments in the Church of England's publication of Living in Love and Faith Project? and the um, video responses that were um, produced by um, some groups around the same time. It's been, it's been sad and difficult, hasn't it, that a, a process precisely designed to be about listening um, gets instantly undercut, and by some of the people who've been involved in that process, um, you know, by producing clearly you know, highly polished videos that were not made within the 24 hours of the release of, uh, uh, of the, the published Living in Love and Faith material. And I, I think there's real questions of integrity around, around that. Uh, um, you know, unfortunately, as, as many of us will be aware, some of the, um, um, the way in which some of the material was used, um, you know, the activities of Christian concern, um, we're, we're just you know grim i mean hateful um and um utterly unacceptable um you know to to feel that they can only sort of make their point by personalizing it mm -hmm. in such a pointed fashion mm -hmm. uh, as they chose to do uh rather than you know talk about their convictions and their beliefs yes um, but but that you know why the need to personalize it on particular individuals um mm. it's quite uh, as i say it's it's hateful it, it's unacceptable um and, and actually i <laughs> i don't think help their cause um i, I, I really don't think it, it it does um so i think it's very sad that such processes get undermined when you know, part of what makes them work is when people, however tough it is, are willing to cling on in there and, and keep sitting around the table with one another. Um, I think some of those um, caught up in it were incredibly gracious. I thought the way Alex responded to it was just just magnificent. Um, so some of some of those present might not know that Alex Claire Young is a URC minister, also co-chair of the Open Table Network. And um, Alex was invited to take part in the LLF uh, process when a tra another trans representative stepped out of the process because they felt it was a really perhaps an unsafe process at that point. So Alex was there, you know, uh, with the hospitality of the Church of England. So it does feel particularly galling that that, that hospitality has been greeted with such a lack of grace. 
Um, you know, so um, we've really felt the, the impact of that um, amongst uh, a friend and colleague in recent weeks. Um, so you've, we've talked about the, the table and sitting at the table with those that, that might um, challenge or exclude us or profoundly disagree with us. But if you could sit at a table with anyone, who might it be? If this could be someone living or dead, um, I think someone I would love to have the opportunity to sit at a table with and converse with would be the, the German pastor and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, particularly known for his role in the resistance against Hitler and, and mm -hmm. some of the extraordinarily difficult ethical decisions he felt he compelled to take in an impossible historical moment, um, both because I find his, his um, academic theological work deeply rich, um, I find his, um, his writings very powerful um, I find his his witness to Christian discipleship quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're all flawed in 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 different ways, and he had his flaws too. But um, you know, I I would be fascinated to sit at a table and and have a conversation with him. Thank you. So we're almost um, at the time that we'll need to wind up. But um, I'm particularly interested in in your experience of the past year, both personally and professionally and as a church really so what, what have you learned in this past year particularly in taking on your new role amid the Covid crisis? We've all learned a huge amount this this year haven't we uh, and Covid hit while I was still just about in pastorate so uh, I, I had my first uh, <laughs> encounter with uh, video editing and uploading things to YouTube which was was quite the ministerial experience which many of us have, have been through uh, this year then you know to move to London in the middle of lockdown and um, take up this kind of role, um, you know, when there are very, very, almost no staff here in Church House for quite a long while, Church House was simply closed. Um, it, you know, it, it's, it's been an extraordinary experience, uh, you know, and to work with colleagues that you don't necessarily know very well at all, if at all, uh, and never to have, have met them. Um, I think it's, um, I think, I, th I think it, one of the, the joys of this um, role is that you get a sort of bird's eye view of the life of the church and you get to meet all these extraordinary people who are doing all these extraordinary things that perhaps you, you were not aware of before. Um, and that's been absolutely, absolutely brilliant and quite fascinating. Um, and with bird's eye view, you also, of course, get to see all places where the dots don't, don't join up and the systems don't work uh, and that all the things are not quite as actually it would be really helpful if they were. Um, and that bit's, you know, just a little bit more worrying because I might be expected to do, do something about some of that. Um, so it, it has been a, a, a fascinating experience. Um, but boy, am I longing for the day that, you know, uh, in this building, I have real colleagues, um, you know, physically embodied to one another uh, in which I, you know, with, with whom I can share this ministry. Um, it's, it's been very odd doing it simply at the end of a camera just like we've all been living our lives at the end of a camera this year. Absolutely. And so we're in the time of Advent, a season of hope and expectation. So what gives you hope for this coming year, for both for the URC and perhaps for yourself too? I think we're all somewhat fixated on the hope that, um, that medical science brings us through a vaccine, aren't we? And, and I suspect what we hope for has maybe shrunk. And we've realised that some of the, the little things really matter and i'm sure um for many of us what we hope for you know is a hug from a friend that we've not seen for a long time um the chance to be able to go and visit parents without having to stop and think about are we allowed to at the minute which tier are we in is this safe is this sensible um you know all of those sorts of things um i think you know one of my hopes for the for the urc is perhaps that i think um, I think this last year and everything we have been through uh, has, has, as it were, brought to the surface all kinds of things that were due to come to the surface, but perhaps might have taken rather a lot longer to come to the surface. I think it's, it's revealed both um, some of the kind of extraordinary uh, ingenuity and imagination um, that there is around the church and the way people have responded to this, and it's also brought to the surface some of the ways in which you know our structures our processes 
where our resources sit uh, and so on just doesn't work anymore. We're, you know, we, we, we're a church with a, a structure, you know, five times the size of the actual church we've become. Uh, and my hope might be that we're willing to use what we have learned in this last year and the recognition of that as a launch pad to say, actually, this is the moment to, to, to think again about you know, what we need to be who we're called to be uh, and, and to live out our faith. Uh, and if we can begin something of that process, uh, which in a very strange way, I think this COVID crisis you know, has enabled us to see with a clarity that perhaps we didn't have before. I meant to that. I think it has been a, 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 a major shift in our, in our awareness, I believe, and I hope myself. Um, thank you so much, John. It's been, uh, it's been fascinating. I hope those present have also um, enjoyed it. And the next Q&A with our patrons, um, we'll be introducing Bishop Cherry Van. So at the beginning of this year, so she also took on a position of leadership during a time of crisis. Um, she was appointed as the Bishop of Monmouth in South Wales on the 2nd of February 2020. And the media interest at the time uh, was focused on the fact that she's the first lesbian bishop in the Church of Wales. And we believe perhaps the first out gay uh, bishop in the, um, the Anglican churches in these islands. And she's also in a civil partnership. Um, and she's also um, had an ex association with Open Table in her former ministry where she was Archdeacon in Greater Manchester. So um, we look forward to meeting her and sharing more of her story next month. And we've got four more of these taking us through to May. And the last um, Q&A will be with Barbara Glasson in May. Uh, and we've mentioned Re Reverend Dr. Barbara Glasson tonight, who was until recently the president of the Methodist Conference. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone. And we hope to uh, be with you virtually, if not physically, uh, um, uh, before too long. So um, wishing you all the, the peace and blessings of the season. And uh, we hope you find some comfort and joy to look forward to hope uh, in the new year. God bless. Good night. Thank you very much, everyone. Good night.